Bloom. You love to hate it, you hate to love it. Bloom has had a bad reputation over the years. It tends to be overtuned or overused. Let's look at a few examples. Here's a screenshot of one of my favorite games, The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. The whole screen has a homogeneous haziness and brightness that blends everything together. The thing I want to focus on is the fact that the shield in the front here has the same level of brightness and glow as the rocks in the background and the clouds up here in the sky. This is one of the main issues my Bloom implementation will address. Let's look at another game, Warframe. I don't think I need to explain what the issue is here. Everything just looks smudged together and the picture is just overall too bright. But again, let's focus on the fact that the snow right next to the character has the same brightness level and glow as the far away mountain. Judging from the UI here, I can tell that this is a much older version of Warframe. I'm not actually sure if it still looks like this today. Both these examples can be improved drastically with tone mapping or just simply tuning the bloom intensity down. But I have been experimenting with a new feature for bloom. My idea was inspired by a tweet made by fellow YouTuber Kitsum. The main complaint is that things close to the camera are treated the same as things far away from the camera. This is true, and I'll explain why later in the video. So as I was thinking about all the ways we can tweak world objects and post-processing settings to improve scenes with bloom, I realized that there's a somewhat obvious solution to the issue of distance-based bloom intensity. This is to use the death buffer in the bloom implementation, something video game renderers use all the time for effects, including but not limited to fog, soft particles, water shaders, and lighting. I am calling this feature bloom attenuation. Note that this video is not intended to be a tutorial, but is meant to be a demonstration of Bloom and my Bloom attenuation tech. Code will rarely be shown and some implementation details will be skipped. Now, just so we're all on the same page and to address some potential misconceptions, here's a quick overview of how Bloom works. The idea of Bloom is to make colors bleed and glow when they exceed the normal range values. When colors exceed this range, they are considered HDR or high dynamic range. I believe this is inspired by the effect we get from cameras when their sensors become oversaturated. But in video games, Bloom is not always used for photorealism. We will see examples of uses when we look at Bloom demos later on. It is important to note that Bloom is a post-processing effect. It is a filter that is applied after everything else is rendered. Most notably, lighting and shadows are already calculated by the time we apply Bloom. This means Bloom can't technically change or affect the lighting of a scene in any way. Think of it as an Instagram filter. These light sources are completely separate from our bloom effect. I added these lights just as a proof of concept. Sometimes the reflected light is bright enough to trigger bloom, but this will not happen in our default settings. So to implement bloom, the first step is to pre-filter the source image. This means we calculate and decide which pixels on the screen are considered bright enough to apply the bloom effect. The most standard way is to use a soft knee function so that we can tweak the threshold of what color values are considered bright enough. Once we have a map of the pixels that we will contribute to the bloom effect, the next step is to blur these portions of the image. As recommended by Cat Lake Coding, I am using iterative down and up sampling with a box filter to blur the source image. Also, to improve the quality of the effects, we add the down samples and corresponding up samples together during the up sampling iterations. This makes blurring less uniform and creates higher brightness intensity the closer we are to the bloom sources. The last step is to add the final blurred result to the source image. This creates the brightening and color bleeding bloom effect that we are all familiar with. This whole pipeline is implemented with the bloom shader with multiple kernels for the various stages, and the images are combined together by using UND's blit function. The pre-filter and blur filtering steps can be quite involved, so I will not be going through the full details. However, I mentioned the soft knee threshold function and iterative blur. This is because they are some of the variables that we can tweak in real time in my bloom attenuation tech demo. Now without further ado, this is how my bloom attenuation works. We sample the death buffer and we multiply it by the pre-filter result. And that's it. In fact, we only need to alter one line of code in the first downsample kernel of the bloom shader. For those who are curious, to render the death buffer, I use a second camera so we can tweak the clipping planes independent of the main camera. This allows us to tweak how fast bloom reduces as objects move further from the camera. This leads to an attenuation effect that is intended to mimic light from varying distances during the post-processing step, hence the name bloom attenuation. So let's take a look at what this looks like.
this projectile demo, glowing particles are shot at the camera. This is what it looks like with standard bloom. And this is what it looks like with bloom attenuation. As you can see, it is much easier to tell how far away the projectiles are and emphasizes the ones about to hit us. Without bloom attenuation, the particles all merge together regardless of distance. This is what the projectiles look like being fired away from us. This doesn't look too bad without bloom attenuation if we assume the projectiles are very bright. However, with bloom attenuation, we can see the projectiles fade as it gets farther away. Here is the bloom contribution view so we can see the differences between normal bloom and attenuated bloom. Lastly, I also implemented a tweakable variable that defines the maximum amount of bloom reduction for HDR objects. This is intended for objects that we want to bloom even though they are farther away from the depth camera's maximum distance. An example of this is the moon. Here you can see that the moon is invisible in our depth view, but still contributes to the bloom. To me, this is a big improvement to simpler versions of bloom. However, this was just a quick side project that I made frantically in a moment of inspiration. I only spent about 4 days to make the bloom implementation in tech demo. This leaves many improvements and features to be desired. The most obvious to me is to make the depth follow the inverse square law to better approximate light attenuation. This combined with realistic light scattering and absorption can eventually lead to volumetric fog. If we really wanted to be fancy, we could also do some sort of Stevens's power law to simulate how the human eye perceives light change. Some other smaller improvements would be tasteful lens flare, adaptive tone mapping, and temporal effects. The rabbit hole never ends when it comes to real-life approximation. Now, you may be wondering, has this been done before? I didn't look very hard, but I didn't find any implementations or demos. I did, however, find an example of the attenuation in the game we'll look at later. There are also similar and adjacent technologies like post-processing volumes, where we can interpolate between post-processing settings and effects depending on where the camera is in the world space. Other factors that may look like bloom attenuation are LOD loading and some versions of adaptive tone mapping. So is bloom really that big of an issue today? I don't think so. Something I personally noticed is that many contemporary games use very little bloom or use it extremely carefully. Let's take a look at a couple of modern games to see what the bloom looks like. First, let's take a look at Cyberpunk. It has an aesthetic where you would expect lots of bloom. Here we can see plenty of bloom in all the signs and lights. Although it doesn't have attenuation, I think the abundant bloom with the lens flares actually look quite good and fits the aesthetic the game is going for. Here we can see that the bright signs and road lights all have equal amounts of bloom. I understand these are very bright billboards and are meant to be seen from far away, but I would not expect this sign on the building and this light right next to us to have the same glow intensity, especially considering there is a hazy fog surrounding the building. I also came across something interesting in this part of the highway. If you pay attention to the yellow lights on the sides, it looks like it does get brighter as we get closer. The light and road textures loading in as we move indicates that there is some sort of acid streaming happening. I think this is due to LODs. As a reminder of the attenuation effect, here's a rough comparison. Doom Eternal is a game I've been playing a lot lately. I think it's one of the most well-designed games in recent memory, and the clever use of Bloom is one of many reasons why. Firstly, Bloom is used extremely sparingly for graphical fidelity. Bloom tends to be reserved for game mechanics instead. For example, this distinctly glowing green color is used throughout the whole game to tell the player where to go next. This particular room uses the blooming green abundantly to indicate that this is a small jumping puzzle and where the goal is. Another example of mechanical use are these red flares to indicate where demons are spawning in. The bloom makes these flares very noticeable in a chaotic and relatively bloomless environment. Similarly, glory kill indications also use bloom so the player can quickly notice it. Something Doom Eternal also does is to use effects and movement instead of bloom to highlight other important objects like BFG ammo and teleporters. 
This again lowers the total amount of bloom on screen, so we can highlight more immediately important elements. As if I haven't given enough compliments to this game, I accidentally found that Doom Eternal does have bloom attenuation as I was recording the footage for this video. I would imagine that it is implemented in a very similar way using the death buffer. I guess you just can't beat id software when it comes to video game tech. Lastly, I thought it would be interesting to look at a slightly older game, Halo 3. As you would expect, the explosions in this game create bloom effects. At a glance, it seems pretty straightforward. But it seems the explosions in this game actually create post-processing volumes. This can be seen when pausing the game in theater mode and looking into the explosions. There is a clear interpolation of screen effects as we fly through it. This effect is subtle, but it is noticeable during gameplay. I thought to include this example because I remember back in the day, people would take screenshots of these post-processing effects and share them on their profiles. Quite impressive considering this game came out in 2007. Bloom attenuation is not something that will fix all the issues with Bloom. We are still far from realistic lighting. But a unique advantage that it does have is the ability to utilize HDR materials more liberally. Certain styles of games may benefit from this, and some won't. The key thing to remember is that Bloom is just a single tool in a myriad of graphical effects. Although it could single-handedly destroy a scene, it's not always the technology, but how it is used that is the issue. I personally think Bloom fits into cartoony or anime styles quite well. It can also be used in unique contexts like dream sequences to elevate the experience. Instead of relying or blaming single technologies, we must combine many technologies with artistic and aesthetic intent to create the look we are going for. Thank you for watching this video, I hope you found some entertainment. If not, you can also try the tech demo, available right now for free. That link is in the description. And if you want to know exactly how this bloom works, consider becoming a patron where I've posted the full project source for download. I streamed the whole development process of this project on Twitch. Consider following there if you like watching game dev or if you have any game dev and programming questions. My next video will be the first devlog for my main project that I started back in 2013. So subscribe if you want to be notified when that comes out. Alright, I think you listened to my voice for long enough. Until next time, goodbye.